So TED is also about hope. Um, my grandmother spent 15 years trapped in a world that we couldn't enter and she couldn't leave. Um, and uh, there weren't a lot of reasons to be optimistic. And yet, I think our next speaker is gonna give us a lot of reasons to be optimistic about Alzheimer's. And his work is so fantastic that it was recently recognized with three Emmy nominations. John Hoffman. Hi. So, um, glad to be here. And, you know, following Jill Taylor is hard. Um, and to imagine losing that kind of uh, consciousness in that way is frightening enough. But to lose it to Alzheimer's is something that is uh, equally scary to an enormous number of people in this country. And so what I'm going to talk about is the Alzheimer's Project, which I was the series producer of. And I'm um, an executive at HBO who oversees these large public health campaigns that we occasionally take on. Um, and what we set out to do uh, with the Alzheimer's Project is to change the way that the Americans think about Alzheimer's disease um, and to try to counter the level of fear that is in the society. And I'll tell you a little bit more, more about that in a moment. Um, Part of the advantage of uh, launching these kinds of campaigns at a company like HBO is that we are a pay cable service. There's no advertising on HBO. We have the ability of reaching 30 million um, households with our normal population base. But when we open the signal for a large public health campaign, we can expand that um, potential audience to as many as 100 million households. Um, and what we find is that with the perception of HBO as being as an entertainment company, you know it from The Sopranos and Sex and the City and movies like Grey Gardens, um, when we step outside of that and we go sort of against the grain and take on the role of providing the American public with public health information, we find that the media plays, pays a lot of attention to what we do. Why would HBO be focusing on something like Alzheimer's? So recognizing that, we uh, feel that we have an enormous ability. We can use the privilege that we have of reaching an enormous number of people and the respect that we have from the media to talk about that. And that combination can generate a lot of attention. So this commitment to good corporate citizenship has been longstanding in the company. Um, and in 19, I mean, in 2007, we premiered something called the Addiction Project. And the Addiction Project was something where we really tested a lot of what I've been describing. Um, and we were motivated often in, in a way that we often, people often are in corporations to do um, public service by the stories of people in, within our own corporation, families within our own corporation who are struggling with issues of addiction amongst their children, their spouses, et cetera. And this was a collaboration with the NIH. Um, and what we did was partner with the National Institute on Drug Abuse and the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism to spread this message that addiction is now reaching consensus within the medical community as a brain disease and a chronic relapsing brain disease that is treatable. And it was our belief, and that was borne out through a lot of study, that the American public does not realize this, does not perceive addiction or did not perceive addiction as a brain disease and a treat treatable one at that. They saw it as a moral failing and we set out to counter that. So when this was done, we, it was a very successful program. I think that we uh, helped a lot of people and provided an enormous amount of resources to the public about addiction that weren't there before. We went back to the NIH and we said, well, that was successful. Um, we would like to do more work with you. We would like to continue this collaboration. Where else is there um, enormous advance in the understanding of a particular 
And where is that also uh, in combination with a lack of awareness of that advance in the public? And what we heard very clearly from the NIH was Alzheimer's. So now this was not the first time that I myself had confronted the prospect of doing a show on Alzheimer's. Um, I was uh, 10 years ago, this is my father, 10 years ago, um, my father died at the age of 80, and my boss, Sheila Nevins, who's the president of HBO Documentary Films, again, born out of the experience of people that we work with and what they're going through, um, asked if I would like to produce a show about Alzheimer's, and I had no interest in doing that 10 years ago. Um, my perception of the disease was that there was no hope, um, that the, uh, the advances were minimal, and the prospect of spending two to three years of my life studying and immersing myself into disease that had robbed my father of his abilities and his consciousness um, was completely unappealing. My father was a newspaper uh, editor um, and a columnist. He ended his career here in Boston. Um, and at a relatively early age of 65, uh, he really was no longer able to file stories. And it was a very slow decline. And he died, as I said, at the age of, of 80. So now these are pictures of people from some of the other films that you're going to hear about. Um, now, what we came to understand in taking on the Alzheimer's Project is that my fear um, was not unfounded and it was not unusual. Um, and there's a recent study that uh, has shown that Alzheimer's is the, sec is the second most feared illness in America. Amongst people over 55, it is the most feared illness. And amongst women, it is the most feared illness. And so this was motivation if the NIH was saying that there's reason for hope, that there's great advances, and we have this existence of an enormous amount of anxiety in the public, we as an entertainment company with, as I said, this privilege of reaching potentially 100 million households, we can play a tremendous role. So, and the numbers are significant. Right now there are about 5 million Americans who have Alzheimer's. But when we were going around the country uh, talking to the experts that we um, were profiling, we went out into the communities to um, talk to people uh, in the various streets uh, in the cities we were filming. And we would go pick a block in a commercial district. And uh, my young associate producer, Matt Heineman, and I would go at opposite ends and just go store to store to store to store and meet in the middle. And we would canvas that neighborhood going in. And what we found is that approximately one third of the stores we went into, people would say, my grandmother was just diagnosed, my grandfather is forgetting to put gas in the car and we have to keep you know, rescuing him. And we heard these stories over and over and over again, people becoming very full um, with tears, of, you know, full of emotion, telling the stories of their parents or their grandparents. And we said the, the, the impact of the disease has to be far greater than what we uh, uh, might imagine the impact would be if we were hearing that 5 million Americans have it. So what we did um, with the support of Fidelity Charitable Gift Fund, we conducted a Harris poll. Um, and this poll showed that 54% of Americans have been touched by Alzheimer's. There's over 100 million Americans. These are people who have a direct uh, experience of the disease. And the same poll showed that one in three Americans is worried or fears that they're going to develop the disease. So we knew then that we couldn't just um, present these, the science, the advances in the science. We had to capture the experience of the disease. We had to make this project larger in scope than maybe we set out to do. And so what we did was produce four films. The memory loss tapes um, is something uh, which I'm extremely proud of. And, and the directors, Sherry Cookson and Nick Dube, have created a film which tells the story of seven people, each with a more advanced um, 
state, in, in a more advanced state of disease, from diagnosis to death. It's an extremely um, difficult film to watch, but it is um, uncommonly beautiful in how it uh, respects and tells the stories of these people. Um, Maria Shriver is an executive producer, along with Sheila Evans, of the entire campaign and hosts this film, Grandpa, Do You Know Who I Am? Some people find it to be the most difficult film to watch, in fact, um, because the ability of the children in the film talking about their grandparents, the, the clarity of their thinking in terms of the suffering that their grandparents are going through, the loss of dignity and respect that they see um, is something that uh, is, is, is just, it's, an, it's unusually, artic they're, they're unusually articulate. Um, caregivers uh, are obviously uh, people who uh, play a role that is almost beyond description. My mother's care for my father was um, really quite remarkable, and we felt that we had to pay respect and we had to model effective caregiving for the American public. And so Caregivers tells uh, the stories of five different families, again, modeling effective caregiving. And one of the most important things is to model how people have to, the caregiver has to take care of themselves. If they don't take care of themselves, they will get sick and then they're not an effective caregiver. And finally, Momentum in Science is uh, two one-hour shows that portrays this optimism that the medical community has been able to um, find. And what we're going to do is play the beginning of the film to give you a sense of the spirit of the, of the documentary. I've been forgetting so many things. I have problems every day with something. I can still cook, but I sometimes forget to put an ingredient in. I made a, a, a pumpkin pie for him the other day, and just before I put it in the oven, uh, uh, I licked my finger and I could tell that there was no sugar in it. There, there are days when I wake up and, and, and I don't know if I, or when, when morning comes, I'm not sure whether I've been asleep at all. Um, I, I don't know what it is. Uh, I don't know what to call it. If we fail to cure or prevent Alzheimer's disease in the years and decades to come, we will be facing an enormous increase in the human suffering as well as the financial and societal impact that will occur. There's been an exponential increase in our understanding of what causes Alzheimer's disease, how we can target it, and how we can treat it. It really is miraculous that in a short period of time, which is really 25 years, and we know a lot about the disease. We are at the brink of, of controlling one of the major diseases affecting world health. It's a true explosion in exciting new discoveries, many of which aimed at the root causes of the disease and therefore implying enormous therapeutic potential. We do have the research scientists, we do have the knowledge, and I think we can beat Alzheimer's disease. So by 
co-presenting uh, the Alzheimer's Project with the NIH, we had an unbelievable access to the research and scientific um, community that is trying to unravel um, this problem, the genetics, the neuroscience, uh, the overall pathology, and obviously developing preventions and treatments of the disease. We spoke to over 200 scientists um, across the country uh, to whittle that down to 25 who were profiled in the films. Um, these people are uh, doing enormous research. Uh, the investment of the NIH uh, is about $600 million a year. Um, many people who would argue that that number needs to increase because of the potential scope of the problem. Um, but one of the most interesting things and one of the greatest areas uh, of, uh, of opportunity for the, the public to adopt and adapt um, is the under increasing understanding of the impact of lifestyle on, on um, the course of the disease. And this, for me, getting back to my own fear and how I used this uh, knowledge uh, in terms of, and, and measured my own response to this knowledge, had a Im big impact on the show. Um, Genetics, for example, the big fear, if my father had it, my grandfather had senility, was that another name for the same thing? Um, I lived with, as I said, this uh, great d degree of anxiety, but when I learned that the general population has a 10% chance of developing the disease, but my risk, because I have a first degree relative, a parent or a sibling, my risk is doubled. That means it goes to 20%. That means that I have an 80% chance of not developing the disease. And that completely changed my world when I learned that. It was not hard to understand. Um, when I learned that, the, that in, there's incredible amount of evidence showing that our cardiovascular health and how we may live our lives in midlife has an enormous impact on how our brain ages. What I mean by that, how we control our blood sugar, our blood glucose, and our blood pressure. These, if you can control these three factors in midlife, you strongly reduce your chances of developing Alzheimer's in late life. Again, this, for me, just rocked my world that I, I thought I knew a lot about uh, you know, science. I thought I knew a lot about uh, conventional uh, wisdom about medicine. I had not heard this. Somehow that had escaped me. Um, that gives power, that gives control in how I live my life. When I learned about blood sugar and learned that uh, people who have insulin resistance and people who have type 2 diabetes have a greater risk, I don't str struggle with those issues. But if I did, I'm glad to know that there's a lot of research and a lot of modern medicine that can control that disease. I have high cholesterol. I'm very glad to know that I can take Lipitor to reduce that. There's things that I can do. These messages of control are things that we try to impart to the public. So one other thing is that exercise. I have to mention that exercise, there's incredible amount of evidence that's showing that cardio, regular cardiovascular um, exercise is extremely um, important to brain health and that it restores brain function, that there's generation of new nerve cells in the very memory centers of the brain that are first attacked by Alzheimer's. It's the only part of the brain where we can, gener can, can continue to generate and create new cells in the memory centers of the brain and exercise can stimulate that. So, All this led to a simple campaign of moving hopelessness to hope. Now, we had partners to spread this word and to generate all this content. As I said, the NIA, the Alzheimer's Association, which is the face of the disease, Fidelity Charitable Gift Fund, and Jeffrey Bean Gives Back. There's 91 drugs in clinical trials. And Maria Shriver as a partner, sorry. <laughs> We created an enormous amount of products. I have to skim through them because of time. Discussion guides, 
6,000 sets of all four films were distributed to community-based organizations. With the support of Fidelity, we were able to spread all of this out, reaching 165,000 people in one-on-one -on -one or in uh, live events. We created a website, a Facebook application for people to pay respect to their families. There's an extensive website. And finally, our goal, as I said, was to change the way America thinks about Alzheimer's disease. And we reached 8.1 million people in the first month viewing these films on HBO. 700,000 people have streamed them, downloaded them on many different applications. All the content is available free uh, on all those platforms in perpetuity. Um, and it's a shocking number to us and to our marketing department, but all of this content, the marketing that went into it, achieved in a world that I don't really know a lot about, but in terms of media impressions, in terms of all the advertising and all the media written about the project, apparently we had 900 million impressions, which has exceeded any other campaign that HBO has done. So I think that we just find enormous um, pleasure in knowing that a message of hope about Alzheimer's uh, and the changing of the understanding and the view of it as something to be feared and rather something that there is meant there can be hope about the future. So thank you very much.